Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf, a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. I'm Mark Oppenheimer. I write the beliefs column for The New York Times, and I'm now writing the fatherhood column every month for The New Republic's website, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we're a little bit late on the on the Pope news, uh, but, but that's what I wanted to talk about first, because when I heard that the Pope had stepped down in this right. almost unprecedented uh, kind of thing, uh, I thought, Huh. I wonder what Mark has to say about this. I, you know, I follow your religion writing. And oh. It's funny that I, who went to Catholic school for 14 years, should be uh, sh should be calling you and saying, what, "What should I think about all this Pope stuff?" Uh, but, but that was my impulse. So, so tell Thank me. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm I'm honored. Um, I'm so it, it's interesting because uh, popery, as I like to call it, is or popology, but I call it popery, is. Um, is this weird subspecialty even within religion writing? You know, the, the, uh -huh. there are people who, first of all, speak um, Italian and so have good sources over there. There are people who speak Latin and have other sources over there. Uh, there are, um, there's a whole world of, I guess you don't call it Kremlinology, but Vaticanology, where um, right. you, uh, you know, you understand the College of Cardinals and you know the personalities of them and you have heard rumors about who various cardinals supported the last time around and how those debates went. And um, and people who know that stuff very often don't know anything else about religion and people who know about a lot of other religion current events don't know anything about that stuff. And I'm in that latter camp, which is I, you know, just don't know that much um, about it. And um, I... Uh, I can say that from the point of view of um, American Catholicism and my Catholic friends and sources here in the United States, and, and you could jump in on this as well, um, you know, there's always this question of what tone will the next Pope set, set. I don't think that Benedict has been there long enough to have set much of a tone at all. He has not, I don't think, exerted the kind of influence. He hasn't appointed um, as many people, as many clergy, uh, as... Um, uh, as his predecessor, as John Paul, uh, not even close. So it, it's, and, and he hasn't traveled as widely um, or been there as long. So the footprint isn't as big, and I think this will end up seeming like something of an interregnum between the prior pope and whoever the next one is, if the next one serves a long time. But, you know, the, what people think of the pope is really, it, it's a litmus test for what they think about other things. Uh, so liberals hope for a liberal pope, conservatives hope for a, you know, a traditionalist pope or a Catholic pope. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the answer is nobody ever knows. Uh, so a lot of people, you know, the bookmakers don't tend to get this sort of stuff right. The, the cardinal from Nigeria, it seems to me, is always suggested as a future pope. And my guess is that's not going to happen because he was so widely talked about last time. Um, and then passed over for someone who didn't bring any of those things to the table, wasn't from the third world, not particularly charismatic, was just the ultimate, you know, the Inquisitor, the Vatican insider. So there must be some reason that, um, uh, that the Nigerian isn't, that Renze isn't, you know, going to get it. That's my one prediction. Right. Well, well, I can tell you, in, in my small corner of, of Catholicism, or, right. or for me, you know, I'm, I'm no longer practicing, but I uh, grew up in Orange County, California, and uh, and went to Catholic school for right. elementary and high school. And John Paul II was always this kind of towering figure, and it, it was almost as if everything about it was, was designed to be a pope who was beloved around here, um, which is to say not only... Um, not only was he charismatic and, and beloved for, for all of the reasons that all Catholics loved him, uh, but he was also associated in the minds of people here with Reagan and the end of communism and being a sort of conservative stronghold. Uh, people people like that association. Right, and he was and he was Polish. At, he was a Polish pope at the time of Solidarity. I mean, he had these historical accidents on his side as well. Right, and so um, I, I think as I've watched friends and family kind of fall away from the church in the wake of the child abuse scandal. Um, John Paul II kind of managed to escape it, uh, almost, in the, almost in the way that, that Reagan managed to escape Iran-Contra. It's like it happened on his watch, but people kind of, kind of thought that, people didn't want to believe that he had anything to do with it. Right. Uh, his personality was such that you kind of, it seemed kind of plausible that maybe he was, he was detached and kind of working on other things. Uh, and... I would say that the towering figure in Catholicism for people around here uh, is uh, Roger Mahoney, 
mm-hmm. and he's he, you know he's not the bishop he's not the bishop where I'm from, but uh, you know he, he, well, he is the bishop in LA, and and the and the news media around here just covers everything. You know, so that if you're living in Orange County, there's a sense in which the mayor of L.A. kind of feels like your mayor right. and the, the bishop in, in Los Angeles. Well, well and isn't he the, nice. isn't he the, the archbishop? archbishop? Isn't he the archbishop of where you're from? Uh, he Well, yeah, I, I don't even know exactly what that means. I mean, we have our bishop in Orange County. Is, is he over the I think an archbishop is over bishop. So I think I think there's a, you know, an archdiocese that he's um, that he's the, you know, the the head of. But um uh, but how that works, you know, in, is not is not my expertise by any means. Um, yeah. And of course, but what, where you were going with that is that Mahoney is, uh, you know, was the towering figure, and now himself is implicated in a kind of, you know, dereliction of duty in the uh, in the, the the molestation scandals, right? Yeah, and and I would say that you know, the, these the molestation scandals have just been coming out, you know, over what ten years now. Um, but uh, since about 2000 was the kind of break, right around then was, was when like the Boston Globe was doing its amazing work on the scandals there. And then yeah. L.A. also had similar scandals around the same time. Yeah. And, and it seems like almost every year another little piece comes out in the L.A. Times that will unfold over four or five days and that kind of dominate drive time talk radio around L.A. And um, I, I think that all along, especially after uh, Pope John Paul II died and this new pope came in, people around here had the expectation that now maybe maybe finally Rome is going to clean things up. Um, they, they had this notion that American Catholicism was kind of forgotten, and some some overseer figure needed to step in and kind of clean house. And uh, and, and so now, as they're about to pick a new pope, and Roger Mahoney is about to go off and, and help be part of that process. Even as I don't know if you've seen uh, the blog posts that he's been writing. No, I haven't. Well, yeah, so Roger Mahoney's been blogging. And it's this very strange thing to have. The Pope is tweeting and Roger Mahoney is blogging. Yeah, so, so Roger Mahoney's blogging and he's writing, he wrote this blog post where he was talking about the humility of Christ and how he never really understood uh, what it was to, to have the humility of Christ, but he's been so criticized and so hated and had all of these uncomfortable interactions lately. And this has helped him to understand and people come up to him and they're very angry and he tries to have the humility to just forgive them. And, and, uh, you know, people read this and think, are you kidding me? You, you have the humility to forgive them for right. being angry at you. I did, I did see things. that. I saw that being quoted that he was forgiving them. Right. Yeah. So, um, it, it, and I've read, I've read a few things in the press, uh, uh, since, since the story broke about how, uh, people, even Catholics, have this inflated idea of of how powerful the Pope is within the Church, of of what he's actually able to accomplish. Um, and you know, for all I know, that that may be right. It's not my area of expertise. Uh, but but I would say that the perception, right, um, is that the Pope is this literally for Catholics, right, uh, at times infallible person, and and this all powerful head of the Church, and. I think that there's a recognition among Catholics that having a, a structure where you have a pope that's kind of not accountable to to anyone has its costs, ha, has its downside. Um, but Catholics like to think it has an, an upside too. And well, it's a this, deeper this image has been. Yeah, go ahead. It's a it's a deeper cultural issue going on here, right? Because the, right, I mean, the pope. Look, he's he's head of a billion person uh, corporation, and of course, a lot of the job is delegating well. Except you don't get to clean house when you come in. You don't get to fire, you know, your managers and bring in other ones. You inherit the the, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, the priests that, that you inherit, basically. So there actually is only so much management that the pope can do from the top, and obviously, he actually doesn't have that big a staff, uh, so to speak. So it's not as if he any pope can come in and really find out who was culpable of what over the last um, hundred years. I mean, and longer, but, you know, the lifetimes of people who were there. So that is true. Um, What a pope could do, and I think what a lot of victims groups want, is a pope who makes it clear that... um, you know, so-called whistleblowers will be honored, that it's actually um, that the priests who come forward or the bishops who come forward and repent and apologize for their roles, either in abuse themselves or in covering up for others, will be, you know, will be seen as the true Catholics and that there will be a culture of, um, of 
uh, you know, of, of, of honesty and of candor um, and, uh, you know, of, of openness, of, you know, of, of adornamento, you know, which was, um, and that sort of, that updating, to use the literal term, of, of Vatican II, which involved openness, which involved kind of letting in, there were all these metaphors about letting in the, the breeze and the fresh air of modernity so that people could see um, that has liberal connotations, right? The, the kinds of things that um, the gadflies want a pope and, and a hierarchy to do to um, to have a full accounting and recounting of uh, the, the sins in the sex scandal are also the kind of things that strike traditionalists as being um, liberal and being modern. Um, mm -hmm. You know, listening to the laity more, for example. Right. Um, and so this is all bound up in, in, in other other debates, other conflicts within the church, right? I mean, if you start listening to the laity, and if you start elevating the people who are eager to point out the flaws of the hierarchy and are eager to demystify the hierarchy and talk about their sins and talk about their humanness and their frailty, many feel quite rightly that you're also playing into the hands of the modernizers and, and the people who would, you know, have the, the guitar mask with the bread and the beer rather than, you know, the right, wine yeah. and the wafer. So it, it's, it's all about, you know, one's perception of the church and how much, I mean, prosecuting people is also demystifying them. Right, so, yeah. so that's, that's why it's, that's one reason that even a, a well-meaning if you're a traditionalist, even if you're well-meaning about the sex scandals and horrified by them, there are fears that you have about listening to the laity too much. Um, yeah, and I guess from my perspective, you know, I have I'm, I'm lucky to know some really great people who are relatively Orthodox Catholics. Yeah, and and, and if there's any temptation I ever have toward religion, it's it's watching. It's it's not arguing with those people. Uh, about faith, uh, which I've done a lot of, but but it's uh, just kind of watching how they live their lives and seeing that there is some wisdom in whatever it is that they're doing, um, that, that there's something special about whatever it is that they're doing, and uh, and yet e even when that makes me uh, you know for a moment more sympathetic to the church or makes me think you know e even if I don't have this set of beliefs, maybe uh, being more of a cultural Catholic is something I want to do, uh, <laughs> and then I think about. I think about the church and I think about, you know, Cardinal Mahoney going and, and being one of the guys who's picking the next pope. And uh, I, I just think, um, you know, all of these guys who are so uh, complicit in this scandal are, are the people who are choosing the next leader. Right. And it, it, that's got to be, you know, there are people with this tremendous stake in certain information not coming out. And um, it, it just seems to me that it, it will corrupt the process in, in such a terrible uh, in such a terrible way. So, I, I, look, uh, I think I think that institution builders are almost inherently, um, you know, complicit in. They're almost always complicit in sin somehow. It's so it seems, right? I mean, you see this at Yeshiva University, where you had the case, um, you know, a, a month or two ago that the Forward newspaper in New York did such amazing reporting on, where you know Norman Lamb, who's this revered leader of, of Orthodoxy, and apparently now is is somewhat senile and can't really speak for himself, but. Um, you know, he when he found out that some of his faculty members at Yeshiva University's high school, at its prep school for boys, were you know wrestling with kids, molesting kids. Uh, in one case, quite gruesomely molesting uh, boys. Uh, you know, he packed them off to teach at day schools in Florida, in Israel. Never told anyone. They always had access to more victims. And he gave this very telling quotation to the forward, where he said, "Well, you know, we." we we didn't see any reason in destroying a man's career over what he did, right? Well, I think that's part of it, right? Part of it was just a generational difference in the understanding of that kind of, 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 of crime and that kind of sin and, and a, la a loss, a lack of sympathy at the time. The other difference is, you know, you're looking at this institution that you believe so deeply in, and it's so easy to tell yourself that um, the price you'd pay for, for telling the truth would be such a huge scandal and such a diminution in the prestige of the university that it would actually be right, worse yeah. for the world. You know, the world needs Yeshiva University. The world needs um, an, an honored Catholic church, they believe. Mm -hmm. So you, right. and they, end up, they end up doing this utilitarian calculus. And, and it's the same thing that fundraisers do anywhere, where they have to go around and suck up to, you know, horrible people. You know, you end up, as Christopher Hitchens always wrote, you know, Mother Teresa sucking up to you know, Papa Doc Duvalier for money, maybe with Baby right, Doc. Yeah. So, I mean, institution builders do horrible things, and we kid ourselves uh, if we think otherwise. 
But, well, this is perhaps a good segue to the piece that you wrote about the NFL and Christianity's place within, right. uh, I guess, Christianity's place within football more generally. Right. And, uh, um, you, you know, you, you write about how, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you set it up, but I think it's a good segue because you you wrote about how, um, you know, some time ago, uh, religious organizations decided we need to be part of sports. Uh, they're a big thing. They're not going away. Uh, we, we need to become a part of them instead of just pretending like we can uh, overcome them. And, and of course, uh, that had benefits and costs. And, and I'll let you uh, jump right. in and introduce your piece. Sure. Well, that was, I think it ran the week between the, the conference championships and the Super Bowl. It ran during the down week uh, in Sports Illustrated. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a started with a history of the engagement between big time sports and big, big time religion. Um, these days, the two seem completely naturally allied, totally inextricable from each other, but it wasn't always so. And even though there were always athletes who were Christians and always Christians who thought that athletics was, you know, character building and morality building, there was also a certain sense that, that religion had to be protected from sports. Um, so you had someone like Billy Sunday, the, the American evangelist of the early 20th century, who had been a baseball player, who believed that baseball was really great for the Christian soul, but of course you wouldn't want to play on Sunday because that was the Lord's Day. And um, even in, in the 1940s, you know, 50s, even 60s in some towns in America, it, it was considered sinful to, you know, there, there were still Sabbatarians it was con who considered it sinful to uh, play sports on Sunday. So there was always this inherent tension, but certainly between the NFL, which is a Sunday sport, and, um, and a kind of pietistic uh, evangelicalism, especially a Sabbatarianism. And then what happened in the 60s and 70s as, was that evangelicalism in all facets of American life began to really engage strongly. So evangelicals who had believed that politics was sinful and they should stay out started rushing in. And that was Jerry Falwell's great innovation, was to bring evangelicals into, into politics, which, um, which of course first happened in the Carter campaign, you know, Jimmy Carter being um, a Southern Baptist and the first uh, real evangelical in a long time to run for, for office. But then they moved toward the Republicans. Um, and that was happening in sports as well, which was that groups like Fellowship for Christian Athletes and Athletes in Action realized that it would be a great site for to get their message out if they could convert football players, basketball players, baseball players, um, people like that. And so this was something that Frank DeFord, the great sports writer, was writing about also for Sports Illustrated uh, in the mid-70s. He wrote a three-part series called Sportianity, uh, the fusion of sports and Christianity. And he was just baffled. He was going around seeing all these players praying on the field. Uh, this had not been his, his whole point was this had not been part of the history of athletics, and now here we are in 2013, and I was saying they've really merged entirely in much more than just a kind of Tim Tebow celebrity way, but that they're they're thoroughly merged. And then finally, what I was saying was um, that there are some pretty serious Christians who think there's a problem here that the the fellowship of Christian athletes perspective, which is that as long as players you know. Uh, give it up for Jesus and pray on the field, and th that they can have an easy fit between their Christianity and their um, and their athletic calling. Um, that that may not be right. That there may be aspects of big time athletics that actually run directly contrary to what's expected of a Christian. But but nobody wants to talk about that, and a lot of evangelicals right. were very upset that I tried to talk about it. Well, so yeah, I, I wanted to push you on this point because uh, it, it, it seems like. Uh, it's pretty persuasive when you, when you talk about football in the piece and, you know, you're quoting guys talking about how, um, you know, the mindset of a lot of football players, which is just, the, you know, the play starts and they want to kill the other guy. That's the mindset that you, that you have to get into to play football at a certain level. And, uh, you know, uh, presumably that's also true of something like, you know, boxing or ultimate mm -hmm. fighting or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so that's almost the easiest case to make that there's, yes. this, uh, um, that there's this tension between big time athletics and so, so is, is that true? Do you think of, uh, of of basketball? Is it true of big time tennis? Is there still is there still well, some tension between? No, less so, right? I mean, we, we can actually talk in a pretty um, in a pretty uh, discriminating way about the differences between sports. And again, I should say I'm not a Christian and I'm not a theologian. So part of what I'm doing is 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 transmitting or parroting views that some people who've thought pretty deeply about this. Um, have, yeah. have said, people have quoted in the piece, John White at Baylor University or Sheryl Hoffman, who's uh, written a great book um, about, about God and sports. Uh, so there are people who've thought about this. Um, and, you know, there are two axes to look, 
uh, here, right? One is, what does the actual practice of the sport do to your soul? Loosely, right. you know, you can translate that into secular terms if you want. Football is very much about crushing the opponent. Boxing, we can infer what that kind of practice, uh, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 hours a week of, of practicing in game day does to your to your habits and your feelings and your soul. Um, of course, that's different if in golf um, or cross-country running um, or skiing. Uh, there are ways in which those sports encourage competition, of course, but but not in the same way and not as violently. And they often, in certain cases, have ethics of sportsmanship that transcend that. So, um, for example, in golf and tennis, um, you call your own fouls, basically. I mean, in, in, you have to get to very high levels of tennis before you know referees. Most people coming up, even at really competitive high school and college levels, you're still calling the, the ball in or out yourself. So the whole sport right. is an honor code, right? And that's the way golf is, too. It, it, it builds up a kind of gentlemanly ethic. Um, and you hear about runners who see that a runner behind them or in front of them took a wrong turn and they wait for the person to catch up and say, you know, it's not gentlemanly to let someone lose a cross country race because they went off course. Right. So, so another way to put it is that the, um, that normal human morality doesn't cease or, or isn't widely regarded to cease once you step onto the playing field in some sports. Uh, and, and, and in other exactly. sports it is. Exactly. And in fact, in some sports, that's right. I think that's a great way to put it. In some sports, you know, the sport is actually a, a venue for your human morality to show itself at its best. And in and football players want to think that it is, but of course, you know, there are many, you know, loyalty, there, there are virtues that exist on the sports field, right? Grit and loyalty and determination, but there are a lot of, you know, non-virtues as well, such as, you know, violence. Um, but the other axis to look on, besides what the sport does itself, is what's the culture of the sport. So even if you're the most gentlemanly, honorable football player who would never cheat and, and always honors the opponent, if you're making $8 million a year and you're in a culture that exalts you know, wealth and celebrity and women and booze and all, all those things, it's going to have effects on your soul aside from game day. And that's different. In, you know, most sports don't have that culture. You know, tr track stars don't get that and pole vaulters don't get that and, you know, golfers don't really get that. <laughs> Maybe Tiger Woods right. accepted. So, right. you know, there's a kind of, football would then be in a league with less violent but equally wealthy sports like basketball in, in that regard. Right, right. So basketball is less violent. It doesn't have that problem, but it certainly has this culture of um, uh, this ungodly culture, I guess you could say. There used to be a player for the, for the Lakers during their Magic Johnson era championship runs named A.C. Green. Right. I remember, he was the Christian, right? Yeah. He would sit on the bench with a green bear on his head. And this was his <laughs> reminder that he was, uh, he was a Christian and he was, uh, he was celibate, not because he had taken a lifetime vow, uh, but because he was waiting until he uh, was married. Right. And I, I always thought that that would be a fascinating uh, it would have been a fascinating profile to travel around the Lakers and to write about, uh, you know, because this is this is the same time we later found out that Magic Johnson was just having, um, right. you know, incredible amounts of sex with women in every city, as he later described after he got AIDS and, and sort of described the lifestyle that he was living. And uh, so, so it would have been a really uh, interesting thing to, to sort of uh, see that from the AC Green perspective and uh, managing to be a part of those teams and still holding himself apart from that culture. Yeah, and, and, and it's also, you know, what, what's interesting is that everyone knows that AC Green, the AC Greens are the exceptions, right? I mean, the reason, right. you, you know, so even in pro football where you have a lot of guys who, you know, you have about half the team, on a lot of teams it seems to be about half are active Christian, you know, in terms of between going to Wednesday night Bible study or going to a Protestant you know, service on Saturday night or Sunday mass for Catholics, you end up with maybe half the roster. Um, but, you know, it's not the case that half the roster is leading a really godly life uh, on the road. I mean, it, it may be far fewer. So, um, and everyone knows it, and it starts out at the high school level, where you have these towns where the football players can do no wrong. I mean, we've, we've read Friday Night Lights, right? Um, which, you know, of course, is the book is what you have. The TV show's good, the movie's good, but it's the book where you really get the full effect of what football culture is like for the you know, the kids um, in Odessa, Texas. So, and, and, and the way that they're allowed to get away with just about anything. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're telling these kids from a very young age that they're gods and that they can do whatever they want. And, and the pastors are part of it. I mean, you, you don't get many sermons in, you know, 
football crazed towns for pastors on Sunday, reminding uh, the kids, you know, about humility. Um, and reminding well, so it's, yeah. So, so I mean, it, it, it's all. Nobody wants to think about this, even though it's quite obvious that football would be a problem, say, for Christian humility. Well, and also, I mean, one thing you didn't really go, go into too much, but it, it seems like sports. There is this. Um, you, you could easily argue that people make a false idol of sports, of, of both athletes. You know, you can imagine. Uh, think about Michael Jordan's career uh, and, and the role he played in people's lives. Um, but also, you know, you, you had that one great uh, little mini anecdote about the couple who decided to go to the Alabama-Tennessee football game instead of their daughter's wedding. And, and right. they were asked, you know, why did you make that decision? Well, I really love Alabama football. Right. You know? uh, th there's certainly people who have a religious attachment to, uh, to football teams. We saw that, too, with the, um, with the Penn State stuff. Um, and, um, you know, both in that... It, I think there's a sense with big time football, especially, uh, but also with baseball and uh, and basketball, there's this attachment to sports that borders on on treating them as idols. Um, and, and now that I think about it, even with golf and, and tennis, uh, which are different in some of the ways that we mentioned, um, probably if there's a sport in America that keeps more average people from church than anything, it's golf. Uh, that's certainly the story right. of my of my grandparents' lives. They were Presbyterian until they until they became golfers and until they <laughs> functioned as their religion. They watched golf on TV, right. uh, they play golf. Um, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a ritual. It happens every week. It's ha oh. happens on Sunday. Um, Absolutely. There's, there's all sorts of homologies between, between organized, between athletics and sports. There's ways in which, in which, and, and, you know, right down to the fact that like there was a time when what it was to be, you know, an educated uh, male, you know, you go back to Puritan New England and what it was to be an educated male who could speak, you know, uh, easily in the town square with other, with other gentlemen was to know scripture. And now it's, you know, to know the Red Sox, um, that that's, that's right. the, the lingua franca. That's the currency you have is that, you, you know, you, you sit down in the barber's chair and they say, so did you catch the game last night? And, right. you know, it, it, almost nowhere would it be, did you hear, even in, in very Christian parts of the country, almost nowhere would it be, you know, boy, did I hear a good sermon yesterday. Uh, I mean, that would always come after, that would always come after Alabama football in the, in the, in the barbershop. Um, but, and I was I was fascinated to read you describing how these groups kind of had a very deliberate strategy of uh, you know of hiring chaplains to travel around with teams and of getting teams to start instituting prayer uh, because um, you know all, all my life the only sports I've ever known are watching athletes on TV thank God right after the game and the post game interview and right. uh, you know you know I, I guess I remember a time when it wasn't quite so overt as like Tebow uh, but but still I've always associated God with um, with, with athletics, uh, from, from watching it on TV and, uh, and the Catholic school that I went to, uh, interestingly, all the sports teams, uh, it, it was like mandatory mass. Like you, you only went to mass at the Catholic school once. I think there was a school wide mass once a semester. Um, so twice a year, but the sports teams, you went to mass every week as a sports team, you went one morning, uh, and, and celebrated mass with your teammates. If, if you played a sport. Right, uh, and this, this was kind of widely hated among uh, um, athletes because you had to wake up early and you had to come and sit. What was your sport? And, and whatever, uh, I played tennis in high school, and uh, and the but, tennis team but, had to go uh, to mass. Yeah, yeah, the tennis all, all teams. I mean, all teams, cross country yeah. tennis, everything, um, but but not all clubs, right? Like if you were on um, mock trial or right. chorus or or whatever, you didn't go to mass for that. Um, well, and, look, uh, part of what you're talking about is this fusion, this assumption on the part of a lot of um, Christians, um, and it doesn't exist, by the way, in the Jewish community or the Muslim community. I mean, as, as far as in the American context, it's a certain kind of, um, of, you know, often conservative Christian, but let's just say Christian assumption that there is something that, that sports and religious observance are character forming in similar and complementary ways. Right. So that that, um, you know, and I'm thinking of, you know, I have some very good. I have a couple of good friends who are Catholic priests and are, you know, great guys. Uh, and in one case was a serious athlete. Um, and I know, you know, I, I know people my age who become Catholic sisters uh, who, in fact, also were it's were our athletes. I mean, there's similar habits, you know, not in the clothing sense, but uh, similar disciplines, shall we say, um, that sort of like single sex bonding. 
um, the, the living in community, the traveling together, the living together, the getting up early for practice, the staying up late if need be, um, the veneration of certain activities, as you said, like regularly, weekly, on weekends. And there's, a, there's an easy way in which people have felt like, well, of course, a sports team, with all they go through together, with all of the blood, sweat, and tears, wouldn't they also worship together? And, you know, nobody thinks about the debate team or the chess club that way, or even necessarily the cheerleaders. Um, but I just think, you know, from the point of view of just as a journalist with no dog in this hunt, right? Um, right. It's just, it's just false. They're just, they're, they're not, you know, the sports. And we know empirically, there's a woman at the University of Idaho, Sharon Stoll, who's been studying the ethics of athletes. Uh, she now has a, a she, 90,000 uh, college athletes have taken her survey in which she asks them questions designed to figure out you know, where they stand on, you know, questions of honesty and candor and ethics and loyalty and all of these, these virtues. And, um, you know, football, hockey, and lacrosse, male football, hockey, and lacrosse players are just, are just the worst. Um, and they're substantially worse than, say, golfers and, and quite worse than, say, female golfers. Um, they, they just, they are, the, they are the least ethical people in society, not the most. And whatever it is they're learning in church, if they're learning something in church, it's actually being undone by their participation in athletics for a lot of them, for a lot of them. So, the, you know, empirically, it just doesn't all work as nicely as the sportianists want it to. Um, hmm. you, you know, I, it, it seems like there's, there's a connection here between sports and, uh, when I, when I think of the virtues that, that you might, or maybe virtues is the wrong word, but when I think of the life lessons that one might learn from sports, right. Um, I, I, I'm writing about this guy who, uh, a guy who founded SeaWorld uh, back in the 1960s. And before that, he was a captain in World War II. Nice. And uh, he was very deliberate about the way that he raised his kids. And sports was uh, something that he thought was tremendously important to build character. Uh, and he thought it was building character in a way that was substituting for them going to war. That it was putting them into situations where they had to overcome adversity and where they were, uh, you know, they, they were faced with these situations where they had to keep cool under pressure and see how they performed when they were tested by another person. And, uh, you know, th th that's what he thought that they were getting out of it. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, for one thing that presumes way too much about the influence we have as parents, right? I mean, it, you know, there, there are kids who, who learn exactly the opposite lessons from participation in sports, you know, who learn that, that cheating works or, um, you know, who learn that violence is good. Or, I mean, there, there are people who learn disloyalty because they hate their teammates. I mean, it, it presumes way too much about the control we have over any given situation, especially, especially our kids. Um, but the other question isn't, you know, the question isn't sports or nothing, right? We have to do things with our time in life, right? And, and mm -hmm. I mean, we have this time on earth that we have to fill. And certainly playing football which, by the way, I enjoy watching, but certainly playing football is a better way to fill your time, um, I guess, than, I mean, I'm going to take a, go out on a limb here and say, than, you know, competitive eating, right? Um, right. I, think, I think it's probably more virtue building than stuffing your face with as many hot dogs as possible in, in all sorts of ways, in, all, in the social capital that it builds, in the life lessons it teaches, in your own health, in all sorts of ways it's preferable. The question is, you know, for a given kid, is it preferable to playing golf or chess or just sitting home alone, you know, reading or staring out the window thinking? Um, there should be just myriad ways that we use our time and, and, and get to wherever it is that we want to be going and, and find whatever, call, whatever it is that we're called to do in a secular or religious sense. And no, I don't know. I think, I, think, I think I'm more sympathetic to the idea than you are that, uh, that, that sports is, in fact, um, you know, putting you in these pressure situations that you might not otherwise face and, uh, and, and teaching you how to deal with them. I think that that doesn't happen automatically. I think it requires uh, good coaches, good mentors, good parents. You know, I've seen terrible sports parents who, uh, who put their kids through misery by standing on the sidelines and shouting and yelling. Um, but, but where I really wanted to go with the sports and war comparison is just to say that um, – in War Two, Christianity has insinuated itself in this very fraught way that doesn't seem like um, it, it's all that consistent with Christian teaching, right? Um, right. Where's the Catholic Church on the drone question that you write so eloquently 
about. Well, it, well and also um, there are, you know, there are Christian chaplains in in the ministry mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. the uh, in, yeah. in the military who, yeah. who go around in war zones and like and there's obviously a tension between um, what they're doing and and what one would think that their message would be and what's going on around them and and, and they've made a decision to make themselves um, they've made themselves complicit in a way in what's going on absolutely and look, the, the chaplaincy is, look let me take it further chaplaincy is in, is often a morally compromised vocation okay. And, you know, I wrote um, a piece for Business Week magazine uh, maybe six months ago about corporate chaplains, about companies that hire Protestant ministers or Catholic, you know, lay people, whatever, to come to their businesses and walk around and, and just sort of say to the workers, how you doing? You know, how you feeling? Um, to some extent, this is a union avoidance move, right? It's let's keep the workers happy by giving them ministers so they won't want wages or collective bargaining or other things that we might give them. To some extent, it's very well-meaning. It's, it's seen as, as part of a human resources package of let's give them, you know, people who can talk to them in a spiritual way, which some of them might appreciate more than, you know, typical counselors, secular counselors. Um, right. But when you talk to these chaplains and say, well, if a worker said to you, look, look, you know, look, Preacher Joe, what I really need isn't, you know, your comfort. It's like a dollar more an hour or more vacation. Would you right. go, Would you go to the boss and say you know, hey, hey, boss, you really got to give your workers more money because, of course, the chaplain is being paid by the boss, just as the military sure. chaplains work for the U.S. government. They work for the war machine. So uh, I'm not saying there's no way to negotiate this, and I think a good chaplain is thoughtful about it, but chaplaincy is a really, really difficult and often compromised way to do ministry. Right. Well, and, and what you worry about in, in all three cases, I think, and, and something that happens in all three cases uh, is, you know, it, if you're uh, if you're trying to live up to the teachings of Christ and His ideals, right? Um, there's a tension you ought to be aware of between that and war, between that and wanting to kill another guy on the playing field, right. between that and and the profit motive, right? Right. Um, and uh, it's it's not to say that um, everyone should just step away and live a cloistered life in in a monastery somewhere where they're not engaging with the real world and are, and are thus never compromised. Um, it's just to say that it's important to be aware of these tensions, and I think that uh, the way that Christianity sometimes uh, is present in these institutions is to is to elide rather than highlight the tensions, and rather to grapple with them. Yeah, it's often there. I think elide is the right word. It's there to kind of lubricate things and you know to sanctify occasions by giving the opening prayer or the, giving the the closing benediction. Um, you know. Um, religion has these contradictory roles in society, which is people like it for the ceremony and for the way that it does sanctify secular occasions. But there is this other role, and you know, the other role is the prophetic role, is the countercultural role, is the role of saying, what, you know, what would we be like as people if we tried to resist all of these secular temptations, be it the profit motive, be it you know, victory in a, in a football game, whatever, be it celebrity. And, you know, obviously that is for some people a kind of monastic impulse that, okay, well then the only way to be pure of those motives is to withdraw. But I think that, you know, at the very least you can ask preachers, you can demand of them, of any faith or, or of our secular moralists, right, that they be at least be attentive to those tensions. And it, it's just astonishing how rarely you see that. Um, you know, so the question that I asked a lot of the, um, the, the NFL chaplains was, what is your teaching about how a player should respond if a bad call goes in his favor, right? So if a player steps out of bounds, you know, presumably you teach them to be honest and sportsmanlike. Um, should a player say to the ref, excuse me, ref, actually, I didn't have a touchdown. That was a bad call. I stepped out of bounds before I got to the end zone. Uh, let's take it back to the two-yard line. And, you know, everyone chuckled when I said that. They, they couldn't even imagine. It's, like it's like they couldn't fathom. How could I be so stupid, Right. Mm-hmm. But it strikes me as a very, very obvious question, um, you know, which is what exactly is it to be, you know, a Christian or a Jew or someone seeking to lead a maximally ethical life or a maximally godly life if you, if winning a game is more important than, than answering truthfully to a simple question, right? I mean, clearly there the game, the victory has become more important than the virtue of honesty. Right. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question, too, because... You know, I, I suppose there's an answer. I suppose I suppose you could say that, um, you know, 
the referees are part of the game, right? And uh, and we all have our role. It, it, it does seem like an insane question to never think of, um, but, but it's also interesting that uh, you know that act that hey, it was a bad call. I didn't, you know, this this isn't. I shouldn't. I didn't deserve this point or whatever. Um, would not undermine the game for the people watching it, right? It, it wouldn't make it any less fun to watch, right? Uh, w- which is ostensibly its purpose. It would only be a personal and a team uh, sacrifice, right? It wouldn't. It, it isn't at odds with the purpose of the of, of the sport, and it, it like it, it can still totally exist if people did that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So no, that, that, that's that, that's right. And as and and. You know, we can t- so the argument which you've begun to, to flesh out, but which other critics have fleshed out more angrily uh, to me is, well, <laughs> what you're missing is that football is a natural suspension of the normal rules. That, that part of the game is everyone defers those questions to the refs. That that's part of the compact of playing the game, just as part of the compact of playing the game is you can, you know, smash each other's faces to the ground, which in normal life would be an unethical act, okay? So right. let's assume that for a moment. I'm not entirely persuaded of that, right? And at the very least, I'd want to, at the very least, I'd want to say, well, how are you going to treat the person who doesn't buy into the compact? What if you have someone who's so pious in his Christianity that he feels the need to not go along with the compact and to say, I stepped out of bounds? Will you at least honor him for his eccentric, you know, Christianity? But Let's leave that aside and accept it for a moment and say, what about after the game, if they say to the player who got the bad call that allowed his touchdown, hey, kind of looked on the replay like you stepped out of bounds there. Can't we at least then expect that if he knows he stepped out of bounds that he would say, yeah, I did. But you know what? It's the ref's call. That's the game. But they don't. Right. right? They don't. Even when the game's over and the guy from NBC or Fox or CBS asks them, you know, wow, looked like, you know, a lot of people thought the replay showed you stepped out of bounds. There's a time where they're out of the rules of the game and they could tell the truth and they don't, right, yeah. which shows how, which shows the corruption, right? That all of a sudden they, the lie grows and, and, and persists for the rest of their life. Right. So yeah. that's, and you know, this is an argument that like drives evangelical sports fans insane because they just don't want to see that this tension could, could exist. Oh, I mean, I think it totally does. And, and, you know, even even as someone who has played pickup basketball both with and without refs, um, anyone who has done that can feel the moral change between the two, uh, where, where people go from being uh, from being honest when a ball is off of them going out of bounds, right, to, uh, to complaining and feeling self-righteous when they're not actually sure who the ball is off of. Uh, I just yeah. finished reading a really provocative book by a psychologist named Peter Gray about uh, liberal education, about sort of re- really radical theories of free schooling or homeschooling or unschooling. And one of the things he he's an expert on play. And one of the things that he argues for is he's, just what you just said, which is that in stickball, in casual stickball, everyone's supposed to be honest and, and treat each other with respect and not hurt each other. And the second that you put kids on a formal little league field or pop Warner football, they're supposed to lie and scream and be big babies. Right. Yeah. Uh, Which I, I had never thought of, but it's, it's true. Um, well, l- let's jump ahead to your piece for the new Republic about how, what you'd like to do is to become a very mild pot smoker. <laughs> uh, is that a fair summary? That's a fair summary. <laughs> we, we should establish right here though. Like I, I laid out in the piece that I, I currently am not a pot smoker. I aspire to, Occasional recreational use. Where do you stand on this on this question? Um, I I'm, I mean I'm for legalization of marijuana uh, ac- across the board and uh, have a lot of friends who smoke it recreationally, uh, which I mostly abstain from uh, because I cough when I smoke things terribly. Um, okay. But 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 for that I would probably smoke more. But I would say my preferred substance is definitely uh, a whiskey cocktail. Yeah, you're a liquor guy. I remember you. Yeah. You're a liquor guy, gotcha. Which I, which I am too, basically. So, uh, um, but yeah, I think that um, well, it's it's you know, in the piece you go through, uh, you know, your own uh, upbringing and your experience with your parents and drugs and thinking about your kids and drugs and um, you know, these are really interesting uh, questions because there is this stigma against smoking marijuana still um, in, in a way that. Uh, people f- would feel much more awkward, right, smoking a joint in front of their kid than having a beer in front of their kid, at right. least most people would. Right. And, uh, and, and I was trying to think, uh, you know, my, I, my own 
gut reaction uh, is that too. I would, you know, it, it would seem weird to me if I, if I walked into my parents' house and my dad was smoking a joint, that would surprise me and seem out of character to me. Um, right. Whereas if I walked in and he was, you know, sitting on the couch watching the Lakers and drinking a beer, that would seem very in character to me. Um, and I don't know, I, I was trying to think how, you know, how rational is this? If I, um, because I'm, I mean, you know, if, you know, if I walked of, in and a friend was smoking a joint, it wouldn't seem weird to me at all. Whereas for me, it's still at this point in life that I'm at and given, you know, I'm friends with a lot of people who have young children, as I do. Um, that would seem surprising to me as well, even though I know who smokes pot and about how much and who doesn't and who maybe would smoke right. more, but they don't want to buy it. And, you know, and yet there's still this taboo. I mean, I think here's what I found really interesting. I mean, what's interesting about this moment is it's becoming legal in certain places, right? So I think that there are a lot of things. There, there is a virtue. It, there's there is a kind of hypocritic or uh, hypocritical virtue, right? Which is there, you do want to inculcate in your children a respect for the law, you know, unless the law is horribly corrupt or or, or right. you know uh, to be disdained, right? Unless it's a really unjust law, you want to respect speeding laws, for example. So if your if your little child catches you going seventy five miles an hour, you say, well, I probably should slow down, even if it's an open road where if you were by yourself, you might treat 75 as okay. Like you, you, you want to show them that you respect laws. And, and so I think there's a way in which for a number of decades, the existence of marijuana laws has meant, you know, c coupled with a kind of really nefarious, uh, you know, right-wing demonization of, you know, marijuana as, as, as if it were as, you know, bad for you as a lot of other drugs has um, meant that parents kind of feel like, well, we shouldn't smoke pot in front of our kids. Um, right. But there are now a lot of states where it's becoming pretty legal or decriminalized. And what I noticed about Connecticut, which my friends didn't even know most of them, is that it's now a misdemeanor at the level, like you basically get a ticket for it on the first offense. Hmm. So right. it's like, wow, decriminalization arrived. And we didn't even know it arrived because we didn't have anything. It's not decriminalized, right? It's not like I understand Colorado and Washington State are, right? It's, it's still right. a ticket, but it's like, it's just a ticket. I mean, I think it's the second or third offense before it gets to be a bigger deal than that. Mm -hmm. So it, there was this kind of stealth decriminalization where I think I woke up one day and said, what, like, why am I not smoking pot? Well, part of it is I don't know where to buy it. And, you know, right. there are other well, reasons. Well, one question, well, one question I'm curious about it, 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 and this is something that, that would just take a little bit of legal research. I wonder if, in addition to being a ticket, if there are implications for having kids in smoking pot. Um, in, in other words, uh, could it be the case, like, if you were in your backyard smoking pot and your neighbor called and said, right. uh, hey, hey, this guy's next door smoking pot, and, and, he, and he called not the police, but he called social services. Um, could, is that yeah. something that they can come and take your kids for? I, I have no idea. Right, um, or could it become an issue in a custody battle? Right, yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. I don't know. And I think that's, but, but I think I've been pretty moved by Andrew Sullivan's persistent blogging that we have to kind of, the more people who talk about it, the less of a unreasonable stigma there will be. Yeah. Um, and I think he's right about that. And so even as someone who doesn't smoke pot, I think part of the point of the column was to say like, Hey, I'm someone who thinks, oh, well, like that'd be fun. Why am I not smoking? And I, you know, I, I got some nice offers after the column ran. <laughs> I have not yet, you know, nothing's, nothing's been consummated, but, um, you know, there are right. people, there are friends and neighbors courting me. Yeah, it's, it's funny, I, I guess. I mean, what's I've office culture had... like, right? Like, you, you've worked in some, in some, you know, it's been a while since I've worked anywhere but in the university, and we're around students and whatever, so I don't, it, it wouldn't be really cool for those reasons. But um, I don't know, like, what's it like at the office of the Atlantic? Could you walk in and blaze up a joint? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, th I think that, but, but, you know, I, I, I think it would be, it would feel strange to walk into the Atlantic with a flask with a drink. of whiskey and just right, set it down right. on my desk. Right. Um, so I suppose the know, relevant question is like, if everyone's leaving, you know, it's not strange in most magazines to say, should we all go to that happy hour? Right. Is it, is it stranger to say who wants to go back to my house and get stoned? Probably yes. At this point. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm talking out socially with, um, with some people at the Atlantic, mostly people roughly my age, and I can't recall a time, and I'm talking about outside of work, I can't recall a time when marijuana has ever been there, and right. I didn't think, I didn't think this is because I'm with colleagues and everyone's being careful, I thought this is just, you know, it, 
it, like pot isn't so common in my world that I expect it to be every place. I have, right. you know, X, you know, I have friends X, Y, and Z who I know smoke pot. And if I go over to their house, I might expect to see it. But uh, I would say that, you know, on a given day, I don't expect to encounter it. Right. Um, no, and, say, you know, and, same for me. Same for me. And I guess, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, a Andrew is, Andrew is like, one of the only, you know, he was an Atlantic colleague, I suppose, uh, who, who was writing about, you know, openly smoking marijuana. Um, but I've never seen Andrew smoke marijuana, despite hanging out with him socially. So, so yeah, I, I think that there is still a stigma. I mean, I think that, uh, and I, I'm actually curious about how I've never actually, I've never actually bought marijuana. Um, but I'm curious about how buying marijuana has evolved because, um, you know, in college I was sort of vaguely aware of like, if I wanted to go to marijuana, I'd probably ask that guy, you know? Right. Um, and now the, the, the relatively few friends I have, I always wonder who buys marijuana because like, well, you know, more friends who smoke than who buy it. Right. I, so I, that's an interesting question, right? Like I, I have two, two data points there. One is I have a friend whose dad is an inveterate smoker who's always ordered it from the West coast somewhere, like arrives FedEx, you know, wrapped in assorted, you know, dog thwarting, uh, you know, wrappings, foils or whatever. I don't know. Um, it's always, that's always how it's been, you know, and I guess he sends him a check. Huh. Um, and they pretend that it's, you know, clothing going through that. I don't know. But that's, that's one guy I know who's been doing it that way for decades. And then another guy I know um, has a dealer, like a guy who's a dealer who um, apparently also deals to, you know, assorted prominent, uh, you know, civic employees. And there's a particular union that he apparently has many clients, so a, a particular civic huh. uh, employees union uh, in a nearby city that he apparently has many clients in. So, you know, I... Like there's a guy and, but my question is, how do you find the guy? I don't know how I found the guy. Maybe he asked the guy at the head shop, yeah. who's your guy. But it is, it is one of these things where I always have felt like maybe, maybe it's, maybe I really do look like a square because really nobody's ever offered to sell it to me. I've been around, it's been smoked and I've borrowed, you know, I've taken hits off of other people's pot, but right. like nobody's ever tried to sell it to me. Nobody said, Hey, do you need a source? So I, I think there is like a vibe that certain people give off or like the dealers, it's, you know, it's like, it's like Gadar is what I think. Right. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I don't know um, either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, uh, but, but I do think that, that, that to go back to Andrew's point about um, how it's Im important to talk about uh, this sort of thing, I, I, I do think that there is... Um, since this is something that so many people try at least right. once, right? right. Um, I, I do think that there, there is a sense in which there are surely healthier ways and, and, and less healthy ways to do this. And the less healthy ways uh, do seem to me the ones that are covered in like secrecy and shame and like um, in, the, in the same way that I, in the same way that it seems as an outsider that the Spanish attitudes toward alcohol that I saw were healthier than the American attitudes toward alcohol where, you know, if you were growing up in a Spanish family, you would start uh, maybe drinking wine with dinner uh, w with your parents at, you know, 15 or something. Right. And you would, you would know what it is to have a glass of wine and to not just get completely plastered. But, like, you would just be acclimated to it in that way instead of, you know, uh, sneaking off in the bushes with your friends right. when they managed to steal a bottle of vodka or whatever. Right. Um, Right. It's just a question of like, how do we socialize people into this thing that is pervasive in our society? Um, and I, I know a lot of people are, a f one reason they fear legalization is that uh, they, they've, it's, it's like they're, they've smoked pot themselves, but they're against legalization because they think it's going to complicate the process uh, by which they talk to their kids about drugs. Um, this is something that David Frum has, has argued in his writing about marijuana. He feels like if it's legal, it will be harder for him to talk to his kids about drugs and to say, uh, this isn't something you should do, at least for now. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't really buy it. I, I don't know. That, 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 se that seems to me a very, I don't know, you know, David, David's always like, 
keeps making the la keeps finding new arguments until he gives up the argument and says, "Okay, fine." <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> It'll be just like with same-sex marriage, uh, you know. And um, and you see people with that struggle, and and what it really is is it's a struggle about. You know, it actually goes back to what we're talking about at the Catholic Church, which is, you know, do you let the do you let the modernizers and the liberals and the the counterculturalists win in every because if they win in one regard, you get afraid that they win in every regard, so that you lose if 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 the government isn't getting your back by saying pot is is illegal, then you'll lose any ability to instill you know discipline in your kids when it comes to substance use. Right. Um, um, you know. That doesn't strike me as particularly persuasive, largely because this is a prohibition that has failed, right? So I don't right. want to, I mean, it seems to me to misunderstand the, the pro-decriminalization argument, which isn't usually everyone should smoke as much pot as possible or kids should start as young as possible, but that this is a substance some people will want to use responsibly. And what's more, prohibition has failed. Right. So yeah, you know, prohibition has like failed the that has all of these costs and, and, uh, and we all see around us perfectly functional adults who right. uh, occasionally smoke marijuana and it seems crazy to incur all of these costs. Right. It, it's, see... it's, the ulti it's, the, it's the ultimate prohibition failure, right? It's like it fails cognitively and it fails as a matter of policy. Whereas, like, the prohibition against first-degree murder is not 100% successful, but I want to keep it because it makes sense cognitively and right. I don't want a world in which, you know, there's a 5% uptick in murders because the the law is no longer there to, to you know, with the threat of imprisonment, right? Where right. I don't want it, the only disincentive to murder to be like public shaming or ostracism, right? I want other disincentives. Right. Um, yeah. But we all know we could live with a 5% uptick in marijuana use if that's what decriminalization meant. So it's just it's just a misunderstanding of the costs of prohibition, I think. Uh, it's, just a, right. it's just a failure of, of, empiric of empirical thinking. Well, I want, to, I want to run through one last argument real quick uh, uh, This on, on a different topic. And I, I wrote this piece for The Atlantic. Yep. Um, a, a Republic Demands Courage from Its Citizens was, was the title. And it's, it's actually an argument borrowed from Jim Manzi in another context. Uh, he was writing about waterboarding. And he basically, uh, it was a very long article that ran through a bunch of objections to waterboarding. And he came down against it for a bunch of different reasons. But one of the reasons he gave was that if we had a terrorist attack like 9-11 every single year, if we had, uh, you know, 3,000 dead every single year from, from a terrorist attack, um, even if that happened, there would still be like a 0.0001% chance of, of any individual person uh, dying in a terrorist attack. And he, you know, basically laid, laid, set forth those statistics and said, uh, look, living in a republic, uh, it requires courage. And if we're going to do something as awful as torture, I don't think he calls it torture, but if, if we're going to do uh, something this awful to protect us from such a minuscule risk, we are failing in having the courage that we need to live in a free moral society. Um, and I, I feel the same way about drones, that, mm -hmm. um, that, that, the, that the collateral damage, uh, the innocent people that we're killing with these drone strikes in Yemen and in uh, in Somalia and in Pakistan, um, it, it's even a more extreme case, right? Because uh, it, this isn't like we've got a known terrorist mastermind and we can maybe get some good information from them. This is there's some guys in a training camp in Yemen, and you know there's ten of them there, and maybe there's a couple of women with them, and maybe a couple of kids. And if we kill these guys, what are the odds that they're going to uh, that they're going to perpetrate a terrorist attack against us? Pretty long right. odds. Pretty long odds. And and, uh, and and not only that, if we kill them and we kill these innocent people, what are the odds that there's going to be some sort of blowback uh, that's going to make us less safe? It's right. hard to quantify that, right? But but it's at least there on the table. Right. And so it isn't even clear that if we do kill them, that it will make us safer. Uh, it just it just maybe will make us safer. And, and, and so, you know, there are a lot of arguments about drones for and against, and I have a lot of other arguments against drones, that I just think that in this one way, uh, Americans since 9-11 have this kind of, you know, especially given that we haven't had even one other major attack, uh, that we just have bought into this extreme, extremely insane risk calculus, where we, we, I understand that terrorism is scarier than a car accident, 
but still, given the amount of money that we're spending and the things that we're doing in the name of fighting this war, it just doesn't compute with the actual risks that we face and the actual fear that we uh, ought to reasonably have. No, it's a terrible risk calculus, but it's, it's um, well, I think there are two things going on there that, 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 that you also uh, are talking about when we talk, or that we're talking about when we talk about drones or torture for that reason. Um, one is um, the, uh, the, the question of just our unreasonable demands for security. Right, that which, which you see all the way down. I mean, last time you and I talked, did, did one of these dialogues. We, you know, I talked about uh, parenting, and um, you know, you, you see it in every every time you talk to other parents. Just the extraordinary fears that something that if you let your child walk down the street by herself, that she'll get kidnapped. I mean, these these totally right. irrational fears against all statistics, against logic. Um, we are right now a safety obsessed society all the way up and down, and there's a sense it is. Be the, the, the moral calculus is now that if you aren't maximally safe for yourself and all your loved ones, then you are morally derelict, right? There's no, right. There are no other goods that, that, that should come into the equation besides safety. Not freedom, not pleasure, not joy, not trust, um, just safety, just prolonging life in some way, right? Um, right. And that, that, that's number one. So it's, it's just, it's, in that way, it's part of a pathology that's in our society generally. But it's also, I think, um, I guess there's some weird assumption being made on the part of the, the politicians, and this is assuming the best case scenario for them, giving them the best intentions, that their legitimacy somehow rides on providing a certain level of protection, a very high level of protection. And I don't think that anyone thought that like Teddy Roosevelt's legitimacy as a leader, that the legitimacy of his regime depended in the same way on the personal safety of everyone who lived under it. Right. So I don't know where that came from, like when it became the case that our president was supposed to do X, Y, and Z to keep us as maximally safe as possible, because that's not what our presidents used to be for in the same way. Right. Um, yeah, I agree with that. It, but but I, I would just say again that uh, in addition to that, it's not even as if... Um, it doesn't it's not work, even right. as if the extreme calculus, like even if what we wanted from Barack Obama was to keep us as safe from death as possible, uh, if that was our goal, the amount of money that we spend on counterterrorism is an insane amount of money to, right. to allocate to, to that because right. there are all sorts of things you could do that would keep us much safer. And, you know, it would probably, uh, we'd probably be spending a lot more money on like, um, you know, disinfecting surfaces and hands in hospitals, right? And right. of, uh, you know, of, of like letting people trade in old model cars for new model cars with all the fancy safety features right. and improving right. roads and right. like all the things that people actually die from. Right. Um, Br bridge and, infrastructure and, you know, better, right. follow, better follow up after uh, reports of domestic abuse and right. you know, all yeah. sorts of things. All kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. And, you know, I don't know. It would be interesting to look at what the most cost-effective things would actually be, but surely it isn't spending, uh, you know, surely it isn't high price tag munitions being fired uh, into rural Yemen. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I suppose, I suppose it's like, it's like this sort of joystick, uh, you know, theater of war. And, and that, um, I mean, because it's only the beginning, right? I mean, as this is the future is that wars will become increasingly, you know, remote. They'll be more expensive, but less, uh, you know, labor intent, less infantry intensive. And, um, you know, that will lead to all sorts of, uh, of, of mistaken calculuses because we don't have the actual skin in the game because our own soldiers, because it actually will always be easier to spend another billion dollars than to deal with the anti-war sentiment that might be generated by an extra five American deaths. Um, on the battlefield, right. right? On the battlefield, right? right. Even though the insane counterterrorism measures are taking money away from things that might actually save more lives. So right. and, it, and prob probably more soldier lives, right? So probably if you spent right. that money on post-traumatic stress care um, right. and prevented all of the suicide, you know, it's more dangerous to, it's just about more dangerous to die. It might, there might be more suicides in battlefield deaths in the last year or something like that. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, um, well, you know, it's, it is one of these, I mean, New Haven, where I live, used to have a, um, a budget board that kind of set the budget, and it was this sort of t council of town elders and wise men who were presumed to be above politics, and they would create the budget, and then it would go to the board of aldermen who would just, uh, you know, rubber stamp it and approve it. Right. And that was abolished because it was seen as elitist. Why should we let this council of bankers and, you know, wise men and Yale professors and whoever was on it decide the, you know, shape the budget and let's have a more democratic system where the aldermen themselves get to write the budget. But, you know, it, you can only imagine how much worse it is now that the aldermen themselves write the budget. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, you know, so I don't know. I mean, it, it probably democracy is going to give us some very, very bad risk um, calculuses in, in things like warfare. And it is. And it has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, it was, uh, it's, it's been fun. We're at an hour, so we should probably knock it off, but we should do it again sometime soon. And I look forward to, uh, to more pieces from you. Absolutely. Likewise. Thanks so much.